For better or worse, the Greek pantheon is more or less the most popular polytheistic pantheon in Western education, pop culture, and magic and witchcraft. Because of that, it can be a little bit difficult interpreting what is ancient practice versus modern practice versus just myth. So today, I'll be taking a wide look at the Greek pantheon, looking at how that applies to figures that people actually work with today. I came up with a fun little ranking system to see which ones are going to be the most popular and the easiest to start working with. I did manage to fit 24 of these guys into this video, so let's not waste any time. Let's get started. Love and Light, Death and Darkness, I'm Jordan from Grimwire, and today we're looking at Greek mythology and modern practice. This video is going to be for people who have any level of knowledge with Greek Pantheon, whether you hardly remember anything from school or you're a huge fan. It's important that it's not just going to be in a mythological or historical sense, but also a spiritual, Hellenistic, or pagan sense. Otherwise, how people are actually using these energies today. So, whether you're new and you want to get an overview of what's out there, or you're a little bit more experienced and want to broaden your workings, or you're not really interested in it personally at all and you're just curious about the personality of these ancient energies, this video is for you. All right, before we get into the rankings, there's two quick things we got to go over to make sure we're all on the same page for the rest of the video. First, let's do a quick overview of Greek mythology. In order to catch everyone up to speed and to make sure we all understand the terminology I'll be using throughout the video, we need a very basic understanding of Greek mythology, so let's go through that now. In the beginning, there was nothing but chaos, the first thing. Then Gaia, the Earth, emerged from it, her being the first among the first classification of Greek beings called the primordial deities, which usually represent huge abstract ideas about the universe and reality. Also included was Uranus, or the sky. These aren't literally just the earth and the sky as we know of them scientifically, but the abstract ideas of space and matter as well. A lot of weird stuff was born, some giants and a lot of other things, but eventually what we call the original 12 titans were born. They were the children of Gaia and Uranus. These titans tend to be more in line with the personification of certain natural phenomena, giving a personality to a natural thing. For example, one of these children are Hyperion, the Titan of Light, who gives birth to Helios, the Titan who is the Sun, and Selene, the Titan who is the Moon. While the primordial deities were more abstract and philosophical, the Titans tended to be more natural. However, Uranus was like a super total massive jerk. He forced his own children, the Titans, back in the womb of the Earth after they were born. So one of the Titans, Cronus, overthrew Uranus by cutting off his genitals. It was pretty intense. Instead of being a super total massive jerk like his father, he just decided to become a mega meanie jerk and not really learn anything from history at all and end up swallowing his own children. Those children, which I'll refer to in this video as the original six gods and goddesses. The mother of these children and one of the titans, Rhea, eventually saved one child. You might have heard of him. He's named Zeus, the king of the gods, and god of the sky and lightning. In a similar fashion, Zeus overthrew Cronus and established a new reign of the gods and goddesses on Mount Olympus, creating a panel of 12 gods to reign the universe. This panel is called the 12 Olympians, the ones most of us know from Greek mythology and is made up of the original six gods and goddesses, Zeus and his brothers and sisters, and eight of Zeus's children. Now, if you're pretty good at math, you can tell that's 14 deities, not 12. And that's because, most accurately, one of them is never really there, so he doesn't count. And at one point in time, one of Zeus's children took the place of Zeus's sister. So there was only ever 12 at any given point. We'll get into all that. It's just important to remember that there are six original deities, which are Zeus and his brother and sisters, even though he did end up marrying two of them. Then there's eight of Zeus's famous kids, which, when these are all mixed and matched, make up the Olympians. So those are the major events and classifications, the primordial deities, the titans, and the gods. The gods have some children with mortal humans, which typically result in demigods, mortal but powerful beings, and some gods have children that are animals or monsters too, and that's just about how everything comes about. 
So that might be a bit much if you're new to the topic, but as long as you remember there's different levels of beings and they each keep trying to overthrow each other and Zeus is right in the smack center of it, then you should be set for the rest of the video. Now that we have an overview of ancient beliefs, the last thing we need to look at before moving on to the gods themselves is an overview of modern beliefs. That is, modern groups that work with these deities. There are three main ones, the first being Hellenism. Polytheistic Hellenism is a modern religious movement starting in the late 1900s that attempts to bring back the actual beliefs of the ancient Greeks in one of two main ways. The Reconstructionalists try to recreate the ancient Greek religion exactly how it was, putting time and research into looking at ancient texts and sincerely trying to do the best they can. Then we have the Revitalists, who believe that myths and religion evolve over time, and they do their best to incorporate ancient traditions and beliefs through modern lenses to bring it back fully alive. Either way, Hellenists typically work with the gods in a traditional, polytheistic sense as individually existing and independent beings. The Olympians, Zeus, Poseidon, Hades, Athena, and the Bunch are going to be the most popular to this group. Next up, we have the occult and left-hand path, especially in ceremonial and ritual magic. Greek gods are commonly used in this type of magic. But in those cases, people tend to work with them largely as concepts and energies, as natural archetypes, not individually existing beings. Some occultists may see each deity as a facet of one complete divinity, different personalities and sides that everybody gets to know differently. Thus, energies related to either A, enlightenment and wisdom, like Helios, Prometheus, and Hermes, or B, ritual and passion, like Pan, Dionysus, and Aphrodite, are going to be most popular to these groups. Finally, we have Neo-Paganism and Wicca. People in this group tend to be a blend of the above two groups. They work with gods in a variety of ways, heavily depending on the practitioner. Having anywhere from a traditional polytheistic viewpoint, or more as the archetypal energies of the occult. Associated deities like Hecate, Persephone, Selene, and Artemis are going to be most popular to this group, as well as deities that are feminine focused, like Medusa, Hera, and Demeter. No matter which group you find yourself in, if you don't know, whatever the case, there are four main ways to connect with any deity if hearing about them interests you and you want to go and try something new. I'll go over these very quickly because I have other videos on this topic as well. First, research them and see if they continue to vibe with you. If they do, leave out offerings, set it out in the morning with care, and dispose in the evening with care, and see how the habit makes you feel over time. If you have an idea of them in your mind, you can meditate on that idea, that energy, and imagine having a conversation with them. See how easy it is to imagine the response in return. Or meditate on their energy and create art in their name. Whether writing, dancing, singing, drawing, or painting, just see how it comes out. So, now you've gotten a quick overview of ancient Greek belief and a brief overview of modern beliefs. I think I've done prepared you for the countdown. Now, let's look at some Greek gods and goddesses. I wanted to take as many of the popular figures as I could and cover them one at a time, but I also wanted to make it interesting. So, taking inspiration from a popular channel, Tier Zoo, I came up with a simple ranking system to help you determine which of these deities is going to be easiest to pick up and go. And that's the first thing I want to emphasize about these ratings themselves. The following ranks are simply my own opinions for how easy it is for a beginner, right now, to go out and find enough information on a deity to both A, begin working with them on their own, and B, find other people who work with them to get some inspiration. While I do take a few things into account, this is certainly not an attempt to compare deities or practices in a total sense. That could only ever come down to pure opinion and personal practice, and it doesn't really even make sense. It would be like trying to rank foods. Going with that metaphor, I'm not ranking which food tastes best, I'm ranking which is going to be the easiest to make in your own home from scratch. So you can decide which one sounds best and get a realistic expectation of what you'll find when you go to look other places. With that being said, of course, 
I still do have my own personal biases, and while I did put about an hour worth of research into each deity covered, I happen to have already known more about some than others. So yes, my research may be incomplete, especially for some of the more obscure deities. I try to give each entry the benefit of the doubt and cast them in the best light possible. So, if you work with one of the deities and I misrepresent or miss something, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to do a follow-up video with input from the community. And with that said, the very last thing before we get into it, and that's a huge shout out and thank you to Yiliad, sorry if I mispronounced it, who did all of the gorgeous artwork you'll see on these cards, and who let me use that for a lot of the video. Check them out on Instagram, especially if you're a fan of the Norse or Egyptian pantheon. They have just as much art for those two as they did for the Greek. The link is in the description. All right, let's jump into it and I'll explain the categories as we go along. Luckily, there's only one deity that fell low enough to fall into the F tier. And the only reason they even still deserve a spot on the list is, well, because it's Zeus. Zeus is the king of the gods and the god of the sky and lightning. Zeus is like the central figure in most Greek mythology where he's often painted pretty negatively. Impatient, aggressive, unfaithful. Zeus's character, however, highlights the differences between the Roman and Greek pantheon. The easiest way to explain the difference is kind of like the Greek gods tend to be more like reality show characters that are generally more fun than inspiring to watch, while the Roman counterparts tend to be the more honorific, polished version. Zeus is like the drunk king chasing women around and starting wars on one level or another, while Jupiter is the great king who takes care of the people and leads by example. It's important to note that that's not always true and not exclusive, especially in practice. I mean, even in the Greek myth, he's not completely evil as far as some of these fellas go. He overthrows his corrupt father who ate his siblings and frees them from his stomach sharing the power with his brothers Poseidon and Hades, and established honor and justice throughout the universe. In fairness, I think he probably did this out of wisdom and fear rather than kindness, but still. Everyone else in this list goes to Zeus when they have a problem, so imagine how you'd feel being responsible for all the problems from the rest on this list. So, the bit of worship of Zeus in Hellenistic communities tend to have that Jupiterian influence of good leadership. And there's also some potential uses doing workings for political change, direction, and guidance. Because of this, Zeus has a surprisingly high relevancy rating, meaning that even today, thousands of years later, and for thousands of years into the future, government and society will likely be very important to us. But he does have a pretty low power rating. The power rating reflects not their mythological power, but how much power they can actually have in your life how many areas they can cover, and how completely they cover them. So, he's just not the most popular to work with, and as far as I could find, there's simply better options in most people's opinions, including Thor, Jupiter, and Odin. Overall, just not the best to get started with outside of a strong calling or niche spell working, but I was surprised to find out what I did, something to definitely look into if you're interested. And from here on out, most of the gods are going to be great choices. I actually had to introduce a curve to make sure they all didn't end up higher. Even then, there were still a bunch who just weren't quite popular enough, either in ancient times or modern, to quite make the list. Yet all of these energies are still pretty wonderful. These are the honorable mentions. For the experienced practitioner, all of these have great specific energies for you to use in your workings, but there's just not too much available on them. In no particular order, we have Iris, the goddess of the rainbow and personal messenger of Hera. We have Nike, the goddess of victory. Eris, the goddess of strife and discord. You might recognize her from Billy and Mandy. We have Melanoe, the daughter of Persephone and Hades, the goddess of nightmares and madness. We have Asteria, the titan of the stars, who is actually Hecate's mother. And Morpheus, the god of dreams and son of Hypnos. Anyways, back on track to the D tier. All the ones who made it into this tier are, in most cases, just not quite popular enough to make it higher onto the list, to find material for them for actual workings. This isn't the biggest deal if you're intuitive and creative, or if you're feeling a strong pull towards one, which I should take a second to make extremely clear. If you feel a pull towards any deity on the list, go look that one up, no matter where they place on it. 
The rankings are just for fun, they're all good energies, just not always the easiest to actually start with. Anyways, first up, we have Hera. Hera is the wife of Zeus, the queen of the gods, and goddess of motherhood. What sticks out to me originally is that, based on mythology, where she's a jealous, angry wife who constantly takes her anger out at Zeus on other people, I thought Hera was going to be in the F tier with him. But in my research, I did find a smaller but certainly vocal amount of people, mostly women, working with a reclaimed version of Hera, a caring mother, a protective deity who can provide guidance. And really, I see where they're coming from. A popular story is how Hera constantly rejected Zeus until Zeus tricked Hera by pretending to be an injured cuckoo bird. She only cared because she thought an animal was in trouble, and when she gave him a hug, it turned into Zeus. If that's not the most wholesome and kind of disappointing thing on Hera's part, I don't know what is. Usually people in this category give her some slack because her hand was pretty much forced in marrying Zeus, and she couldn't really do much to him, so what was a few mortals in the span of Greek mythology? One of the main things is that overall she's just not that popular, to the point where alternatives like the Egyptian Isis, or Gaia, or pretty much any other Divine Mother come to the forefront if you have no other preference. That leads to a pretty low uniqueness score, which reflects how many other similar options there are, and whether or not the deity is seen as the best choice among the options. Fun fact. Hera was so vengeful at all of Zeus's extramarital affairs that the only way one of his children survived was because they received Hera's name, just to please her. That didn't really help him in the long run, because she still tried to hunt him down pretty much his whole life, and, believe it or not, you've almost definitely heard of that child, and he's the next one on our list. More popularly known by his Roman name Hercules, Heracles gets a spot because he's a pretty positive manifestation of the Divine Masculine, and is worked with today, although not too popular at all, hardly anything can be found online. Yet, Heracles can provide very balanced, very earthy strength and confidence, while deities like Ares and Zeus can provide masculine confidence, they're all kind of fiery and a little bit more difficult to access. His most popular story is The Twelve Labors of Heracles. This is one of those cases where Hera targets one of Zeus's children. Heracles was trapped by Hera into having to complete 12 tasks, or labors, including killing a lion that couldn't be hurt with weapons and that cut through armor with his claws, killing the famous Hydra, the beast who gained two heads every time one was cut off. There was also a bunch of hunting of other creatures, including convincing Hades to take Cerebrus, the three-headed dog from the underworld, fetching some armor from an Amazon queen, and cleaning some stables. Essentially, Heracles is kind of like a goofy but strong best friend. He was the only demigod to become a full-fledged god upon death. He's often described as a good-natured, but yeah, sometimes buffoonish hothead. In one story, the heat of the desert frustrated him so much he shot an arrow at the sun, which might sound kind of silly, but hey, he did hit it. However, he immediately realized his mistake and apologized to Helios, the sun, who is also next on the list. Helios is the titan who is the sun. Although Apollo is a separate but associated energy under most conditions, some in ancient Greece did seem to interchange the two. Either way, while a lot of texts and rituals do invoke Helios to some extent, it's usually as part of a larger ritual, not the point of the ritual itself. But the sun provides light and heat to all of life and represents the creative force, inspiration, and action. There's not many myths in which we get to see the personality and interaction of Helios with other deities. He's usually just kind of somebody who sees everything from way up high. But, he really is the best personification of the sun that I personally know, most of them are kind of judgmental. Continuing with the H names, we have Hephaestus. Hephaestus is another one of those I didn't think much of until looking them up for this video. Traditionally, Hephaestus is literally quoted as God of the Forge and Metalworking, which immediately, to me at least, always painted a picture of a kind of simple blacksmith, but I couldn't have been more wrong. For starters, Hephaestus was said to be the skill and crafting equivalent of Athena, and went a little further. While there's no doubt Hephaestus was a blacksmith, he made weapons for just about every god on Olympus, I just think that barely scratches the surface in terms of what he actually did. 
Hephaestus didn't just create weapons, but he created machines and gadgets of all sorts, making things like the first automatons or robots. In fact, in one story, he managed to capture Hera in one of his machines, all because she was his mother but disowned him as a child, only letting her free once Dionysus was able to get him drunk and chill it all out. See, like I said, it's exactly like a reality TV show, tying up your mother until your brother gets you drunk enough to chill out. Today, I think it may be more accurate to think of Hephaestus as the god of engineering and creativity, of solving problems, technology, society, and moving forward. Hephaestus was incredibly ahead of his time. He's extremely unique and could provide inspiration and wisdom to anybody who creates and builds. The last entry in the D tier is Prometheus, the titan of knowledge and the flame, who got into some serious trouble by Zeus for bringing fire, metaphorically and literally, to humanity. His punishment is iconic, to be tied to a rock and have his insides picked out by vultures every day until he heals at night and has it happen all over again. Prometheus is a figure who is much more prevalent in mythology than in popular practice, but does make D tier because of his connection to the left hand path, related to Lucifer as the light bringer, the one who provides awareness and enlightenment to humanity. Similar to Helios, Prometheus commonly gets called and mentioned in other texts and rituals, just not by himself. If you're somebody who's into the occult and ceremonial magic, Prometheus is certainly worth a look into. As you can see, all of these energies are pretty unique, pretty powerful. It's almost kind of sad there's not more people working with them. But if you're pretty experienced and you want to take part in helping create more information about these guys, then this past tier would be a great place to start, along with the next tier. What connects the C tier overall is that they're all very balanced, very average. There's quite a few people working with all of them. They're all pretty relevant, pretty unique, pretty solid choices, but each one tends to either lack in balance or power. We'll start with Poseidon, brother of Zeus, god of the ocean, and abundance. Similar to some other deities on the list, Poseidon doesn't quite have the relevancy he used to. Sea travel has nowhere near the connotation it used to, nowhere near the impact on our lives. But the symbology of the sea, providing life and abundance and being overwhelmed by its size and beauty and power, is timeless. Interesting about Poseidon is that in the Mycenaean religion, the one that immediately led to the Greeks, Poseidon takes the place of Zeus and Hades, kind of like a three-in-one super god of the skies and underworld, taking Zeus's place in a lot of the myths. Otherwise, in the Greek myths, he was responsible for approximately as many births as Zeus, fathering mortals, gods, giants, animals, and a whole bunch of other stuff. The myths he's featured in usually portray him as a wrathful, extremely powerful deity, pretty much ruining the life of anyone who so much as insulted him in a specific way. But the people who worked with him saw him as both a protective deity and one who would grant abundance and blessings. In modern witchcraft, Poseidon can also help with the magic realm, divination, power, and wisdom. Up next is another classic Olympian, Ares. Ares, the god of war and passion, is another deity I initially expected to be pretty low on the list, just because of his unbalanced personality. What I didn't expect to find was a somewhat large group of mostly men who had reclaimed Ares' energy, to be more in line with the polished Mars energy. To these practitioners, Ares represents a protective, courageous, masculine energy. One who takes action, one who's dedicated, and one who gets things done. If you're somebody who has wanted to get in touch with an energetic, alive, strong energy, this may be a good place to start. In myth, he was often in competition with Athena, his sister of strategic war, and one of his most famous stories is when he got in trouble by having an affair with Aphrodite and was caught by Hephaestus, but all the other gods found it simply funny. Almost the exact opposite of Ares, we have his youngest brother, Dionysus. Dionysus, the god of drunkenness, wine, ecstasy, and ritual workings. 
Unfortunately, this is one of the cases where the myth of Dionysus seems to be a little larger than the actual amount of people working with him today as an actual deity. It's not uncommon to see jokes and memes about Dionysus, and even sometimes find invocations as part of a bigger ritual, usually with Pan, but I've been unable to find much modern dedication to specifically Dionysus, despite there being a decent amount of individual practitioners working with him. Either way, Dionysus is that energy you get lost in. Imagine dancing in a forest in the middle of the night, having had some wine and just getting swept up in the music, experiencing an almost weightlessness and pleasure. That's Dionysus, one who I certainly think deserves more legit attention. Dionysus is the only full god born from a mortal woman, and actually achieved godhood and ascended to Mount Olympus. In these stories, Hestia decides to resign from her official position, and that's why sometimes you'll see lists with either her or Dionysus as the 12th Olympian. Dionysus is by far considered the youngest of the 12 Olympians, and is either presented as a young effeminate man, or as an older, rugged, bearded man. He was generally kind of like a wise drunk who liked to help people when they thought they learned their lesson, but he did take out some creative punishments to those he thought deserved it. Demeter, in terms of this list, is like the female counterpart of Poseidon. While her main domain is not really relevant to most of us nowadays, the secondary characteristics have really filled in with modern practitioners. Demeter's main domain is the goddess of agriculture, something that most of us simply don't have to worry about too much. However, being the goddess of the harvest and abundance, she's said to fulfill just about any desire you have, all while providing a gentle aura of protection. Demeter is one of the original Olympians, siblings with Zeus in the bunch. She's also Zeus's first wife. Her most famous myth is most likely the one with her, Persephone, and Hades, which we'll go into more later, but it's important now because it shows she has the negotiating power over both Zeus and Hades. She becomes so upset the whole food supply to everybody is cut off. Winding down on the C tier, we have the oldest and least well-known of Demeter and Zeus's siblings. It's pretty easy to remember Zeus's brothers and wives, but the next entry is kind of like the big cool sister who just doesn't want to deal with the family issues. And that goddess is Hestia. Hestia is the goddess of the home, hearth, and family. While Hera is the typical go-to for the kind of big powerful queen goddess, Hestia is warm and friendly and welcoming, and straight up has average stats all across the board. A good deity for somebody looking for an easy energy to work with, although unfortunately not too too much is available on her. She was popular back in the day, taking into consideration that nearly every home was essentially a temple of Hestia, but she didn't appear in too many myths because of her humble nature. That didn't hold her back, as she was incredibly important, responsible for maintaining the fire, the hearth, of Olympus. Even though she provides protection of the home, which is arguably the most important place to need protection, it does kind of limit her as opposed to a more general protective deity. Hestia is one of the three deities to be considered immune to Aphrodite, the goddess of passion and love, and, as previously mentioned, the deity who gave up her official Olympian position just to have a quiet life. Next, we have the only Titan and the last entry in the C tier and that's Selene, the Titan of the Moon. Selene is the calming, soothing, peaceful aspect of the Moon, providing insight and just a smidge of good luck, and said to be incredibly beautiful. Selene gets a lot of mentions from eclectic practitioners, and it seems that she's very popular among witchcraft practitioners, but there's not much solidified or directed material on her, usually kind of simply portraying her as the mother aspect of the triple goddess, along with Artemis as the maiden and Hecate as the crone. So the C tier is more important for more experienced practitioners. They all offer a pretty unique blend of energies. They're just not the easiest to find complete information on, so you might have to adapt some of the limited material out there to your own practice. 
Meanwhile, the B tier is going to be much more popular and well-rounded. The B tier is where we're going to find deities that are powerful and relevant, that have a decent following, and are just great to know about. The B tier deities all have a specific path where they tend to stand out the most. Let's kick it off with Pan. Pan is the god of the wild, sexuality, and passion, the primal aspects of human consciousness. Pan is ranked here because of his connection to both the horned god of Wicca and Baphomet of the occult traditions, said by some to be one and the same as one or the other. Pan is typically pretty unusual looking to say the least, a half-goat creature with horns. He typically doesn't have an interest in power and is a free spirit, a trickster, but sometimes like really creepy in stories. Pan wasn't technically an Olympian, but he certainly held his own with them. In the stories that do mention his birth, he was often the son of Hermes. He hung out with Dionysus a bunch, and he battled, but ultimately did lose to Apollo in a music battle. What's holding Pan back, however, is that the energy is pretty imbalanced, meaning that it's both difficult to see the positivity in his myth, and to responsibly interpret that energy because it's just kind of wild and addicting. Note that some interpretations are more wholesome than others, of course. I'm just talking on a general scale across communities. Next is the last of the original gods, the last and the highest ranking of Zeus's siblings. And that's Hades, the god of the underworld and wealth. Nowadays in popular culture, Hades is usually Christianized to be the devil or some variation, but in Greek mythology, everyone went to the underworld, and Hades was closer to the protector of souls, not the punisher of the damned ones. This account is largely reflected in modern practice, where Hades is worked with for his power and structure and order, being a reminder of the beauty of life, with a little bonus boost to working with spirits, if that's something you're interested in. What's holding Hades back, however, in this case, is that most of the popularity seemingly comes with his relationship with Persephone. Most, but not all, accounts of working with Hades that I can find usually include a disclaimer that they have mostly have experience with Hades only through her, but otherwise, Hades is a strong deity to work with if you feel the call. Hades' own palace was comparable to all of Mount Olympus. After all, he was the wealthiest of all the gods, since gold, silver, and precious stones were found beneath the earth. He's the only one of the original siblings who were not technically one of the 12 Olympians, and that's because he kept his distance by chilling out in the underworld. Hades is featured in a lot of stories, and is actually usually pretty solid to work with. He's almost always shown giving people who approach him a shot, but they really have to earn it. One last thing, just a little clarifier, is that Hades is not the god of death. The god of death is Thanatos, whose mother is our next entry. Nyx is the primordial deity of night, space, and void. She emerged either right after or sometimes even before Gaia from the same chaos. Just to show her primordialness, her own darn children are Thanatos and Hypnos, death and sleep itself. She's just that old. Nyx represents the eternal mysteries that we'll never know. Death, darkness, and chaos. She carries heavy Saturn energies and is kind of like Selene, Hecate, and Hades all combined into one. She's just a really powerful, mystical, magic energy. Unfortunately, even though it is an incredibly alluring energy, it's kind of unbalanced like pants. Some people are just unable to connect to the darkness, no matter how much it glitters and shines. Because of that, I think, and since she's not quite as overall active as Hecate or quite as soothing and pleasant as Selene, that leads to her decreased popularity as an actual goddess. Nyx doesn't feature in many stories, but I think a pretty funny story is when Hera asks Nyx's son, Hypnos, to try to put Zeus to sleep. Hypnos wasn't quite powerful enough to do it for long, and Zeus wakes up and goes after Hypnos very angrily. So, Hypnos just goes straight to his mother Nyx's house to hide, and Zeus just kinda plays the forget about it cause I'm scared of her card. Not even technically a demigod in mythology, yet still making it pretty high on the list. Because, through time, and over the years as her myth has gotten more and more popular, more and more people have started to turn to her as a source of strength. Medusa is one of those figures that I think probably literally everybody knows, with the infamous hair of snakes and power to turn people into stone just by looking at them. For most people, however, that's pretty much all they know. 
the story of Medusa is actually pretty tragic. The most popular version, portraying the origin of Medusa, had her starting off as a beautiful woman, until one day she was in Athena's temple when Poseidon sexually assaulted her. And Athena was so mad at Medusa... Wait, Athena was mad at Medusa for getting attacked? Are we sure about that? Okay, so we'll look at some other versions in Athena's entry, but yeah, in the one that's most popularly told, Athena gets angry at Medusa, so she curses her with the snakes and the stones and pretty much what we know. This tragic story is interpreted nowadays to paint Medusa as a strong, vengeful protector of women, someone who sympathizes with them and has their back, a very caring and protective dark goddess similar to Lilith and Lamia. While Medusa is a relatively minor figure made huge by pop culture, the next entry has a similarly odd relationship with popularity. With most deities on this list, they have one or two domains that establish kinda who they are. Hestia, goddess of the home. Neat, she's cozy. Poseidon, god of the ocean. Ooh, he's big and strong. Hermes and his personality don't quite work this easily. Most notably, he is mentioned as the messenger of the gods, but is also said to be the trickster god and a conductor of souls. He's the only deity besides Hades and Persephone and Hecate that can enter and leave the underworld with no penalty. So the little speedy messenger god has aspects of beings both like Loki and as mentioned Hecate. Hermes is a key figure and is the second youngest Olympian deity but quickly establish his place among his family literally the day he was born. This was done by playing a trick on his brother Apollo. Hermes stole his brother's cattle and hid them. Finally, when Apollo tracked him down, Hermes played dumb and so Apollo was forced to tell Dad. Well, Zeus found the whole thing quite hilarious, how Apollo was outwitted by a baby, and Hermes ended up getting away with it and enticing and trading his brother, the very first liar, instead which ended up becoming a key symbol of Apollo himself, as the god of music. Hermes scores very high in power, because he was said to have helped with like literally every aspect of life. Business, travel, money, fun, honor, depth, language, thieves, sports, music, and shepherds, the list goes on. And yes, this is actually the same guy that was known for his incredible speed in traveling planes of existence, with his little winged sandals and helmet, becoming the inspiration for the superhero The Flash. And he was also known for his caduceus, the staff with serpents intertwining. You might recognize this from anywhere. Overall, Hermes is a helpful and kind-hearted deity, helping heroes in quite a few myths, but not very straightforwardly. Hermes plays tricks on just about everyone in Olympus, even including Poseidon, who, just a requote from earlier, was a wrathful, extremely powerful deity, pretty much ruining the life of anybody who so much as insulted him in a specific way. So Hermes definitely had some guts and must have had some brawn to back it up too. With all of this said, Hermes doesn't score very high on the chart because while he is one of my main deities, there's not much out there about working with Hermes exclusively. Most references to him are as the planetary energy of Mercury, which is close, but not quite what we're looking for. Also, there are other options that are simply more popular, including Loki and Thoth. So the B tier is made up of pretty solid hitters. You really can't go wrong with any of them. But what makes the A tier significant is that you'll almost be guaranteed to find some sort of hymns, poems, art, altar setups, spells, workings, tons of things related to these deities. They're pretty big in modern magic and paganism and are either very powerful or very friendly. In each case, there's only gonna be one thing holding each deity back from the S tier. Starting here in the A tier, we'll start a countdown to the last deities. There's only seven left. And who better to start the A tier than Persephone. Persephone is a goddess of duality, of both life, spring, and vegetation, but also very popularly married to Hades. Thus, she's the queen of the underworld. Unlike the other darker energies on the list, Persephone is incredibly balanced and friendly, really a joy to work with overall. 
She's pretty popular nowadays in the magic and witchcraft community, if I had to guess because of her personality and dual nature. Kinda like the best of both worlds. The story of how Persephone and Hades got together has many variations, and is very popular, but most people who work with Persephone tend to agree on the version of it where Persephone has the most choice in action. As the story goes, one of the few times Hades was above ground out of the underworld, he caught sight of Persephone and asked Zeus for her marriage. Zeus agreed to the marriage, but he knew Demeter wouldn't allow it because she'd never get to see her kid again due to the nature of the underworld. Instead of asking Persephone about her thoughts, Hades and Zeus both set up a scheme which definitely falls somewhere on the kidnap scale, somewhere from a trick to abduction, depending on the story. But even after Demeter forces Hades to return Persephone by starving all of life everywhere, Persephone does decide to return of her own accord, loving her husband, and the deal for her to spend half the year on Earth and half the year on the underworld is struck, which explains the seasons. Another popular goddess is Aphrodite, the goddess of romance, love, lust, and passion. Aphrodite is probably the most unique origin story of any of the deities on this list, although there are two of them. If you remember way back to when the Titans were fighting the primordial gods for the first time, Cronus cut off Uranus's genitals and they fell into the ocean. This giant splash created sea foam from which Aphrodite was born. In other stories, she's simply one of Zeus's children. Aphrodite is said to have incredibly intoxicating divine power. Only Hestia, Artemis, and Athena were immune to her charms. Aphrodite is understandably known for having relationships and did so with, um, all the Olympians? Let me double check that. Okay, so I guess that's only technically includes Hephaestus, Ares, Poseidon, Hermes, and Dionysus, which are only the males who aren't Zeus. And that's just of the Olympian gods, not including anyone else. Overall in her myths, she's presented as an extremely protective and caring mother, but an unfaithful and spontaneous spouse. This, along with the two birth stories, led to a later creation of Aphrodite Urania, or divine love, and Aphrodite Pandemos, or common lustful love. There's also speculation that this was an idea influenced by puritanical Christianity, who didn't like the gross physical sexy times to be the same as pure divine love, so take that with a grain of salt. Notably, there is also another, unrelated form, Aphrodite Aurea, who was found pretty much only in Sparta, and was closer to an Ishtar, Astarte, or Freya, a goddess of love and war. What's holding Aphrodite back in this list is that she's a little bit of an unbalanced energy. Her domain is love and passion after all, and there's not much that can be more unbalanced than that. Once again, this is the A tier, so it's not a huge thing, just honestly something to be aware of. Next, we have about the exact opposite energy of Aphrodite, and that is her sister, Athena. Athena is powerful, balanced, and friendly, and although she's not very popular today, she was one of, if not the most popular Greek god back then. We can see this by looking at the capital of Greece, Athens. The story goes she had to fight Poseidon for the honor of that name. Not physically, unfortunately, because that would have been fun to watch, but with a gifting contest to the people of the city. Poseidon gave them a new spring of water, but it turned out to be salt water, so it was pretty much useless. Athena gave them an olive tree, which provided oil and firewood and was a nice symbol of peace, so she won. Although scholars are pretty sure it actually happened the other way around, that is, the goddess was named after the existing city, it's still a pretty cool story. Athena was said to have been born from Zeus's head, which is a symbol of her wisdom. We get an interesting split with Athena. Sometimes she's the clear hero, sometimes she's the clear villain. For example, recalling the story of Medusa, she's a total massive jerk to her, punishing her for being victim of a crime. We see another example of this in the story Arachne, where Arachne beat Athena in a weaving contest, fairly, and Athena just turns her into a spider. However, while these are the most popular versions of these stories, they're pretty uncharacteristic of all of Athena's other appearances, and there's evidence this villainous side of her appeared later towards the Roman rule. More traditional Greek interpretations feature Athena turning Medusa into a gorgon because that way she's able to protect herself and make sure it never happens again. And similarly, she turns Arachne into a spider to help her further improve her skills and protect her from the wrath of Zeus. Athena was so key to the ancient Greeks because she represented both the strategic side of war 
and the arts and humanities, such as weaving, metalworking, and philosophy. She was one of the few deities with no children, but she kept a close watch over heroes and those she cared about, including Heracles and Odysseus. The next deity is surprisingly close in energy to this one. The closest thing to a masculine version of Athena is surprisingly Apollo. Apollo is a great, positive masculine energy, similar to Athena. He's powerful, balanced, and friendly, and extremely popular in history, but not very popular today. Apollo was said to be Zeus's favorite son, and Athena his favorite daughter. And thus, Apollo was historically seen as the male counterpart of Athena, the powerful and strong, but creative and wise deity, even though, yes, his sister was technically Artemis. Apollo was said to be incredibly powerful and beautiful inside and out, said to possess the best music and art of all the gods. Because his father was Zeus, and more importantly, his mother was not Hera, that gave him and his sister a rocky start to life. Pretty much from even inside their mother's womb, they were constantly defending her from the monsters and giants Hera would send their way. Another deity Apollo is compared to is Hecate, He's said to be the Olympic counterpart to her thonic energy, meaning Apollo controls the magic and divination of the light, and Hecate controls the magic and divination of the darkness. And, speaking of the titan of witchcraft, next on the list is, number three, Hecate. Really only two types of titans got to stay around after the war between Zeus and his father. The first were natural deities that were kinda needed, like the moon Selene and the sun Helios, but there were one or two younger titans that just didn't really care enough to join the war, so they were never banished. Meet Hecate, associated with magic, witchcraft, protection, and the underworld. Hecate was Persephone's companion on her yearly trip between the earth and the underworld, and was said to be pretty good friends with Hades. Interestingly, it's believed Hecate heavily attributes to the modern trope of the witch. It's said you could only catch her walking around at night, under the moon, with only her animals, and perhaps a spirit or two. I think what makes Hecate truly stand out is two things, and that's one, she's also said to be a goddess of the shunned, oppressed, and unconventional people, which is like pretty awesome and wholesome because the rest of Olympus is just like one giant frat party of appeasement. And second, once you become comfortable with her darkness, she's an extremely friendly and comforting figure. Unfortunately, as powerful as she is, she's not the easiest to initially reach out to due to her dark and sometimes overwhelming power. And finally, that leaves us with the S tier. Before we finish the countdown, I'd like to give one more little friendly reminder. If you work with a deity and they didn't quite place where you thought, that's probably because this is just counting down who's easiest to get started working with. If you're wondering why a deity didn't place higher, you can ask yourself three questions that might help shed some light. A. How well does the personality you've gotten to know match up with the myth? B. How comfortable would you feel recommending that deity to a complete stranger by name only with no other explanation? And C, how many others have you randomly run into that also work with this deity? In order to make S tier, the deity in question had to pass those questions with flying colors. In fact, no matter how experienced you are, honestly, I'd recommend to reach out to these energies at least once or twice. They can deepen anyone's practice and relationship with the world and their life. Any guesses on who it might be? There are only two deities that managed to make the S tier, both because they're so friendly, accessible, useful, easy, and popular. Number two on our list is Artemis, the goddess of the moon, magic, the wild, and protector of the innocent. I have to admit, I'm probably a little biased on this one because I work very closely with her. I actually did a short video on her here, but I did think it through very carefully, and I still think Artemis rises to the S tier for a few key reasons. Simply, when it comes down to it, I do think she's the easiest of the moon goddesses to begin working with, for all the reasons we've covered on the list so far. She has a wide range of powers. She has the friendliness, she has the popularity among ancient and modern practitioners, and 
almost all, if not all, of her myths portray her as a strong, independent soul who deeply cares about nature and those under her care, including her mother, who she protected with her brother Apollo since they were children. Her main role in ancient Greece was as a protector of women and children, but anyone who messed with her and her animals got it too. Really, there is only two things you could do that actually make Artemis angry. The first is hurt an animal, and the second is stare at her while she was naked. Things did not go well for those who broke one of those two rules. As a modern practitioner, she can help with divination and magic, guidance and wisdom, confidence and protection, and creativity without needing a whole bunch in return, as long as you're respectful and appreciative. And finally, we made it to the number one easiest deity to work with. What makes this deity stand out and truly earn its spot is that it's the only one that's kind of survived under the radar this whole entire time. See, if I were to walk up to a stranger and say, hey, I'm raising money to help protect Father Sun or Father Sky or Mother Moon, just about everybody would look at you like you were crazy. They might even kind of know what you mean poetically with some of those, but they certainly know what you were going to do with the money or what the heck you were thinking in general. But we all immediately recognize the phrase Mother Earth, Mother Nature. It stuck with us as culture. And while I can't personally find hard scientific evidence of a direct connection, I think the connection is pretty clear. Especially when there are people who know the name of the following entry without knowing its Greek connection at all. That's right, the easiest Greek deity to begin working with is Gaia, Mother Nature, Mother Earth. Almost every religion works directly with the Earth in some way, and the Greeks personified that into Gaia, a word that gets used today even without the strict connections of the Greek primordial goddess. In the first myth, as we discuss, Gaia is the mother of all life, besides a very few other siblings. But some of her first children are Uranus as the sky, yeah, that's her husband too, the sea, and the hills. Gaia is presented as caring about all of life, and is hurt when both Uranus and Cronus decide to hurt their children. Besides that though, she doesn't really show up in the stories featuring the Olympians, just in those creation myths. Regardless, she really doesn't need much other explanation. She's the mother and home of us all. Did your deity end up where you thought? If you enjoyed this video and want to see more about all paths, religions, traditions, and pantheons, please be sure to hit that subscribe button. If you really, really liked the video, please be sure to hit that like button and leave a comment telling me if I should cover the Norse or Egyptian pantheon next. Either way, thanks for watching, friends. I'll see you around.